Good morning, everyone. My name is Miss Ellie White. And yes, I'm the Ellie White that made the original video. I died and went to heaven. And I just had this feeling this morning like some of you might want to have a little bit of encouragement in your life and discuss with you some of the things that have happened to me since that day. I did immediately wake up and discover this golden, brilliant, shining gift and immediately know what my path was. After laying in that hospital bed and having 38 specialists looking at every tiny individual system and piece and part of my body to discover each specialist what may or may not be wrong in their area of expertise as to why I was dying, um, they never did figure that out. Jesus asked me, well, certainly you're a Christian, and I'm going to give you the choice. And you can certainly die and go to heaven right now if you want to. You're a Christian, you'll go to heaven. Or you can go back and discover what is that great thing that I have for your life. And so... As I continued with that conversation and decided that, yes, I do want to go back and discover what is that great thing that I'm supposed to do in my life for God. It hasn't been an easy road since. Um, I, at one point, began working on a case to save homes for 20,000 families that were having their houses stolen illegally. Um, mine was one of the first in this scheme to defraud Americans, which initially, my part of the story, lands us in Wisconsin. And after it was sort of, you know, fixed and finalized, all the little tweaks to make it work in other areas, it spread and went to, at last point, 15 states, 100,000 families in each one of those homes, um, in, in those states being taken, 100,000 times 15 states plus the initial 20,000. And yes, my farm, which I desperately fought for, um, was sold and used in a pay-for-play, uh, 300,000 to secure a DNC seat, and 3 million that would have landed the same individual as Secretary of State had her candidate been elected. So <laughs> the money from my farm was stolen, sold, and used for an illicit further plot. So this was all extremely disheartening. We had break-ins in our home every second or third week, sometimes just stealing all of my little girl's art projects or all of my bras and high heels and coats or other such things to embarrass and demoralize us into not fighting the fight for these 20,000 families. Um, at one point, I was run into uh, by a vehicle at a store and landed myself with an emergency back surgery and a subsequent gigantic stroke, the first of eight, in which um, spinal ejections had you know, torn through um, other areas in the spine and made it dangerous for me to be upright at all or even on a pillow. So I had to remain laying flat on a concrete floor without a pillow so that the fluids from my brain went drain down the spine and get pushed out these holes and I die <laughs> again and so um, it was the most difficult time I landed in the ER more than a few times for extremely high blood pressure um, it was running consistently at 258 over 158 and, you know, they would sit there and poke on your arteries and things and go, oh, this is cool. Look at her readings are going off the chart here on her EKGs and stuff. Um, and they didn't know why I wasn't literally in the middle of a full-blown heart attack with the levels of blood pressure being that high. And after going to um, a specialist hospital who I knew, the very best vascular surgeon in the entire world, and... Um, worked with him on numerous conventions, three cities a day around the world. So as soon as they said, you need a vascular specialist, I went, aha, I know all of them. 
I was a part of ISES for many years. And so I went to this individual and they looked inside my arteries and little pictures down inside your heart. And, and, um, they went in through my lower areas into the lower arteries, uh, looking for blockage, anything that would cause that extreme of blood pressure. And they said, everything was clean. Everything's spotless. The only thing that could be causing this to your body is that you're still in extreme pain and your body's jacking the blood pressure so that you know that something's wrong. And I'm like, well, thank you, body. But I, I know that my back is now seriously messed up. Um, I lost four inches in one day, the day that I was hit um, by this vehicle at a store. And so I know that things were seriously smashed all around in, in different directions and caused this sudden loss in, in height even. Um, so it hasn't been an easy road at all that's, that's happened now. Um, I oftentimes will say the wrong words because I have to allow my body that peace and that restfulness just to say what wants to come out instead of trying to fight with those words. Um, they told me I'd never walk again. They told me I'd never talk again. And I think for two and a half years, um, I couldn't walk for four and a half. I couldn't speak more than four words in a day for the first two and a half years. And, and gradually that came back to me. And how it came back to me is because since I couldn't do anything except lay down on my back, um, I opened up a social media account and I posted a picture of myself from a modeling shoot and it was just like the upper, like a bus shot, like you see on the screen now. But um, I put a picture up, wrote a sentence or two, boom, it's open. That was it. Didn't put a lot of effort into it. I only did it because a friend of mine that lived down in Chicago that's the only medium that he used to talk at all to anyone. Just write him a note on social media and boom, he'll get it. So I did it to remain in contact with these friends of mine. And when I opened the computer the next morning to finish the profile or whatever you call it, it was blocked. <laughs> it was turned off. And I wrote and I said, well, I've had this account for like a couple of hours. How can you possibly turn this off? They said, well, you used a professional modeling photo and, and we don't allow that, you know, people to just take other people's work. So, so we, we cut it off. And I said, well, yeah, but that's me and I own my own photo. So they turned it on and released all the mail that had been sent to me just in that first night. And there was like 4,800, I think, letters from people going, oh, I want to meet you. And so I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I'm going to go through each one of these letters that are here right now, and that's it. And I'm going to see if it's possible to actually meet somebody that's decent on social media. I went through all of them and spoke with a couple, maybe two or three out of all of them. And I decided, nope, <laughs> people that try to meet you on social media have issues. Okay. You ask them a question and they respond 12 hours later after they get, they get the flavor of the wording just right. They're mostly inept at personal communication skills and that's why they're sitting on a computer and they wait 12 answer, 12 hours to respond with one sentence back. So I gave up on that and I said, okay, what else can I do laying down? Well, I started reading my Bible. And I ended up reading my Bible for 10 to 14 hours a day, front to cover, front to cover, front to cover. I could go through the whole Bible, um, I think we decided in three months. And so between like 05 and 09, I read the Bible four times a year. And then I lost track of the hours in which I was going to read when. But um it basically retaught my brain how to think because it has all of the spelling, all the punctuation, all the different sentence structures within it. And just the allowing myself to relax and take in the reading of the Bible, you know, at my own pace 
And I would do most of the hours, like 10 or so a day, just silent. And for about first a half an hour, then an hour, then up to a couple hours or two or three or maybe four, I would try to read it aloud. This so that I could um, allow the scripture to be heard by my child that was sitting at the counter near my now couch um, and, and could hear the Bible so that I would be teaching the Word of God to my child as well. And that was painstakingly slow and difficult once I started learning the words to even translate them into saying them out loud. So it hasn't been easy. And I'm now facing where a neighbor who's a 16-year pill freak um, wrote a citizen's ticket to try to keep me from any travel so that I can't go back to South America um, and witness to the little children and the guys stuck in prison and stuff like that. Um, I can't travel anymore as long as this fake citizen's ticket is sitting over my head. Um, and they did this to keep me from traveling so that I couldn't go missionary to further try to demoralize me as they put me on a blacklist in my local town that I can't get a job. I mean, I went to a Starbucks and I walked in and the guy said, well, let me write down your name here. And he wrote my name on a napkin and went to go ask the powers to be in our little tiny town of Big Bear Lake, California, whether or not. I could be allowed to be hired. And the same thing happened at the two local markets. In fact, I was called into an attorney's meeting with the head of the boys club for this little town. And they had the manager of one of the markets sitting there and they were redoing his divorce to drop his payments by $100 a month in exchange for harassing me. So I have now lived in this tiny little town for seven winters, on the, I'm on the edge of losing my family's home, um, with no heat. I've sold trash. I had a garage sale for three days straight two weeks ago and sold half of my clothes um, just to make it through winter so that I, at that point, um, had splurged on keeping the gas on to 45 degrees just so that pipes and things don't freeze, because they have six of the seven winners, um, to make it till now, which it was, it's been consistently running between 12 and 22 degrees at night outside. And after two o'clock in the afternoon, I don't open my door. I try to get the sun to beat down on the house and raise the temperature inside by even a degree or two, or if I'm really lucky, three or four. If it's warm enough outside to let the sun bake and heat the house. Um, I lived for about three years going to a local food bank that only offered um, pasta, bread, cookies, cakes, crackers, uh, bread type snacks. Um, once a month, a, a bag of rice or beans. And I lived that way for three years. And one day, a lady from the local Catholic church went into the back refrigerator and she passed out to me, you know, with nobody else getting any or seeing it, a three pound package of store brand 20% fat beef, ground beef hamburger. And I looked at that and I cried. Because I hadn't realized until that moment that I had not had any fresh vegetables or fresh fruits or meat in my diet at all. And at that point, um, I had gone like six months without having, you know, a gallon of milk. So God doesn't promise that the path is going to be easy, but I've now lived under serious persecution from these people for 17 years. Um, 
I'm single. I have no family that can help me. I have a child that was born 12 and a half weeks premature. Um, the placenta being entirely ripped out of my womb at 12 weeks pregnant. And the doctor came in after birth and said, this is a miracle baby. Because there was no umbilical cord. The cord was ripped out of your body. The placenta being over the cervical opening when you were 12 months, 12 weeks rather, um, pregnant. And little by little, it just simply rotted away inside of you. There was no umbilical cord. And they kept watching on these, sometimes daily, at least weekly, sonograms. But he would kick, look around, and then he'd start to, you know, suck his thumb and play with his ear. And then he'd kind of curl up and he'd go to sleep and he'd watch him sleeping for a while. And then all of a sudden he'd wake up and look around and, and start swimming again. You know, literally in my womb. And um, they originally had him doing this on a giant screen TV about... You know, here to my face, what, a foot from my head. And I watched him go through those interactions over again several times for eight and a half hours straight. And then the doctor walked in and said, um, there's no way to save the baby. You have to have an abortion. You're young, you got plenty of time. You know, there, there's not a way. You just have to have an abortion. And about two and a half later, hours later, he had me all talked into this. And then as he walked out of the room, his shoulders were just in the doorway and his back was to me. And he says, well, besides, it would have cost the insurance too much to save him. And I went, whoa, wait a minute. Come back in here. You mean that you're telling me to have an abortion because it would cost too much money to save my baby? Your job as a doctor is to save his life and get him here. And when I'm well and I'm out of the hospital, then I will argue with the insurance company about how much my baby is worth. How much is her baby worth? And that one, and that one over there. And I called up my personal doctor, and I said, you need to get him out of this room, make sure he never comes near me again, and make sure that everyone does whatever it takes to get this baby here and saved. And so the baby was born, didn't have an umbilical cord, but he was born 12 and a half weeks early. They said, with us severing, you know, an artery and doing some kind of a brain-lung bypass to pump the blood you know, faster or better through the body so that you're oxygenating the far extremities of the fingers and toes. You know, I'm sitting here in the hospital, in this problem pregnancy hospital, the whole floor donated just to this problem pregnancies. Um, they sent a helicopter and it landed just outside of the incubation um, intensive care unit for babies. And they were going to fly me and my son to Cedar sinai to do this bypass thing. And they said, you know, his IQ is going to be, you know, 20 to 25 points lower than it would have been um, because of us permanently severing, you know, these arteries through the brain. So my husband arrives and they started to explain the procedure to him before they load us. And all of a sudden he takes over 1% off the life support by himself. He was on an adult respirator at maximum capacity. And I was ordered up until that point to be absolutely silent and don't allow the baby to know that I'm there. Because if he <gasps> leapt for excitement for any reason or a cough or anything out of sync with the machine, it would literally burst his lungs. So they explained to my husband what the procedure was and what they were going to do. And he pulled off 1% on his own. And they said, well, wait a minute. Let's just wait and see what happens in a little bit. And so he pulled off the life percent, 1% on his own. Every eight hours, he took 1% on his own, 1%. And so that didn't happen. And my other child, um, the same attorneys which called me in to show me the store manager that wasn't going to hire me, getting his alimony reduced by $100 a month, um, my daughter, who was working for that same entity, I walk in and the attorney is sitting there laughing and he tells me that he and his little boys club are the ones that are responsible for giving to my daughter an environmental man-made cancer for which she has to travel off of her mountain and travel minimum like 60 miles and sometimes all the way to some specialist hospitals in Los Angeles 
for drugs tests and treatment to measure what's happening with her and to keep this man-made environmental cancer that she was given by them on purpose in order to stomp me down and thwart me and make me not able to travel um, back east to assist in finding attorneys that can help save or recoup the homes for these now 1,520,000 families who lost their home over a fraudulent plot, which a um, director, friend, and writer said, I want you to write down everything that happened, exactly word for word now, while it's still in your brain, and write it in this format, in a screenplay format. And so I did, I have no idea how long it took me to get that ready, but it's called Conspiracy Series, The New Land Rock, the new land fraud scheme of the 1%, and it shows as author E-G-A-R, all caps, white, like the color, um, through Amazon or Create Space. And so, you know, I'm sitting now with seven years with no heat. A um, couple of years I've been able to keep um, gas on at minimal, like 45 degrees, and as my little girl is growing, um, we jumped into one bedroom, both of us in a separate little twin bed, and had a giant um, fluffy, one of those feather comforters on top of us, and we would take a bath and then put on pajamas or sweats and then put on a coat and a one of those Peruvian little lambs hats and even cotton finger gloves and jump into bed like that and we would put we had two dogs a dog under each one in her bed under her blanket and one in my bed under my blanket so that the dogs wouldn't freeze and we would help you know share each other's warmth and when we spoke as we're reading our bible we were laying there like this with our little gloves on you could see this the smoke or steam or whatever coming out of our mouth it was so cold in those rooms it would be around 40 degrees. And, um, you know, that hot shower and extra clothes and sticking a dog under the blankets was how we survived. And so it's been absolutely hard, but God can see you through everything. And there's been a couple people that seriously made fun of the fact that, oh, your video's monetized. Or you say, you know, please contact me at buffalo study at yahoo.com. Or if you can support um, us going forward with doing, um, Bible scriptures where we do a sermon from every single chapter in the whole Bible. Um, and we were asked to do that by six different pastors in our town here. And so we decided to take me talking about those same, not just in the written form that we did for all the churches for free, but to do it as a video for anybody that might want to just turn on and, and, and get some understanding or listen to one of these sermons. And so you can help support me in that. And it's paypal.me forward slash buffalo study at yahoo.com. And if you can't, then please gain some sort of um, encouragement that no matter what it is, you have to go through. And even if, if people are threatening your life, we've had numerous attacks of people um, sending it. One attack was five officers into our back door. And they were speaking in the hallway about how they were going to break down the bathroom door and they were going to shoot and kill us both. And a 9-11 lady saved us. She sent 50 firemen from four different fire stations. And they were all standing in our yard at under two and a half minutes. And she said, there. Now we got witnesses too. Now they can't kill you. So it's not saying that life's going to be easy. But the rewards that God is going to give you in heaven will far outweigh anything that they can do to you. And you know, God will keep you safe. And he says that no weapon formed against you will work. No serpent bite, you know, poisonous snake will kill you. God will keep you safe as long as he has a purpose for your life. And that means pray, read, study, and stay away from sin. Because God told the woman caught in adultery, go and sin no more. And he would not have told her that if it wasn't possible. So whatever your addiction or handicap or living with someone in sin is about, Get rid of it and pray to God and give it to God, and he will bless you, both now and in heaven, far more than any of these people can understand. 
And I know they kidnapped us in the middle of the night. They kidnapped my daughter and hit her in various places three times in one town alone. And when the jail, whole jail started shaking and every door opened up and all the men's and the women's side, boom, 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 you could hear them all just clanking open. And the head jailer's son came in and said, stop it, stop it right now. And all of a sudden my whole body and face and skin and everything just started glowing. Like instead of being white and scaly, I came out of the shower and it was like the color of bronze and just brightly, brightly glowing. And, and I had just prayed, God, you know, they're feeding me a bread end that's moldy instead of the meat sandwiches that everybody else is getting. Just please help. You'll transform my body just like you did Daniel and his friends in their captivity. And he did. I took my shower and I came out and everything was absolutely just golden and glowing. And, and all the doors clanked open. And that happened twice while I was in there. And the second time, um, I went back into my little solitary confinement, steel isolation hold for 23 days without being given any reason. And God said, I want you to pray right now. What do you want? And I prayed a kind of nice, you know, Miss America prayer. And God said, no, I want you to pray specifically what you want. I said, God, I want within this hour for somebody to call me on the phone and say that they're letting me out of here. Before I was done saying my prayer, they came on the intercom and said, come out and use the phone. There's a phone call for you. And I got on the phone. They said, the judge is sending you home tomorrow. They were scared that if they didn't release me as they were trying to oppress me and hold me and put me down so that I couldn't go and save these homes back east, they thought that, you know, God was going to blow up their whole town and make lava flow all over the half of the state if they didn't send me out and get me out of there. And they were so anxious to get rid of me when they knew that God was supernaturally protecting me. So be encouraged, whatever your faith is, God will keep you safe. And as long as you are praying, reading, and keeping yourself free from sin, God will give you supernatural miracles. And, and all those little steps that happen all along your life, they're all for a reason. Okay, so maybe there's not just one giant purpose that God sent me back for, but maybe he, his purpose was to encourage you so that you can go out and, and see a thousand miracles a day in your life, just like he did for us when we went to South America with nothing. You know, we said, God, if they're going to take everything away from us, our stuff and our life, then we're going to do one big giant thing for God. And we went to South America, me and a little girl with a day pack on our back, each of us full of just fruits and nuts and $300 to our name. And God gave us a thousand wonderful miracles a day. So go out and find out what those miracles are for you. And, um, you know, we'll see you in heaven. <laughs> and please write me at buffalo study at yahoo.com or paypal.me forward slash buffalo study at yahoo.com. Thanks so much. God bless. Have a great day.